A few years ago, we spent a few days at a friend's lakeside house that she had rented out. We just wanted to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city and go somewhere to unwind and somewhere we could take our dog. The house we got was perfect, just as I had expected from having seen the photos. At the time, it was early spring, but still warm enough to be able to sit on the couch or on the porch in the mornings on the love seat, a blanket over my legs, coffee in hand, whilst my husband took the dog for a long walk. It was one of those beautiful mornings, only just light, but I'd been dying to sit out there and finish the end of my book when I saw something in the lake. Now, let me just back up a moment. I didn't see it at first. I smelt it. And my God, did it smell. It was like rotting death in an open sewer. An utmost terrible stench. I know that water comes with its own natural odor, especially being a pond or a lake. And, not the salty sea. There was an occasional smell when the wind caught the wrong way. But, nothing like this. It was dreadful, as if the dog had left a pile of presents for us after eating something he shouldn't have. Putting my hand over my nose and breathing through my mouth, I looked out into the water to try and see what on earth could be causing it, and hoping that something nasty hadn't washed up on shore. I might sound selfish, but I don't want my little vacation to end with wildlife services coming down to remove a dead something or even worse, the police. After scanning the shoreline, I couldn't see anything which was somewhat of a relief, even if it did not explain the stink. I began to wonder if one of the neighboring properties were having plumbing issues when something in the water caught my attention. I can recall it vividly. Since it wasn't full daylight yet, parts of the lake were still in shadow but I could clearly make out a shape in the water that seemed to be bobbing about. Reaching over, I put my glasses on, and immediately, the fuzzy shape became more clear. But I still had no clue what it could have been. You see, it looked like it was in the water. Whatever it was, it might have been some sort of dinosaur. Of course it wasn't but that is the best way I can think to describe the shape of this thing. It looked, from the parts above water that I could see, it had a long neck, a small head, and a large body. It was far enough away that I couldn't make out any certain details, so I couldn't tell you where its eyes were, or exactly what color it was, although it appeared a sort of dark brown, or maybe gray. I could not see any limbs, but I suppose that they were under the surface of the water. It just sort of rose up from the depths of the lake, and somehow in doing that, stirred up the water, causing the smell. That's what I thought must have happened anyway. I wish I could have thought to have raced off and found my phone to take a photo. As you see, I didn't have it with me. First off, I'm not one of those people who are glued to their cell phone. And second, I don't actually like having it with me when I want to read. Too much of a distraction. I got the distinct feeling that if I dashed back into the house to get it, this creature would be gone. So, I just sat there and watched it for another few moments. There was nobody else around, as it was early in the season, and most of the houses that were used for vacations were still empty, and I guess that people lived there were either still in bed, or possibly too busy, getting ready for work to be sat staring at a lake. After a few moments, it was as if the creature just decided it had had enough, and slowly resubmerged under the water. I was still sat there, staring out. By then, the waters had settled, and thankfully the stench had left. My husband was now back. He just looked at me, and can tell by my facial expression that something was up. I know what I saw, or rather I know I saw something out of the ordinary. 
I actually have no idea what it was. But there sure as hell is something living in that lake. I know, because I smelt it and I saw it. I never did exactly tell my husband. And I don't believe in lake monsters, but maybe an unknown animal could be living around. Everybody knows there are certain things to be mindful of in the sea. You wouldn't go swim with the sharks without protection. But it isn't just the things that we know about that we should be careful of and respect. After all, the ocean is so vast that we have no real idea what might be lurking under the water. But sometimes we get to glimpse at something that doesn't even seem possible. This happened to me and a buddy one day when we were doing some marine research of our own and we were deep out of the waters off the coast of Spain. We had been picking up some unusual readings on our sonar equipment and were feeling rather excited and interested to see what we might have come upon. Before I go further, I should note that I'm not an actual scientist or marine biologist. I'm kind of a freeform researcher. I've bought and collected equipment over the years, and I like to do research of my own, like I said. So it's become more of an obsessed hobby. Anyway, there had been reports by local fishermen of some strange sightings in the waters, and we were out here trying to see if we could discover exactly what they had been seeing. We were hoping it might lead to discovering a new species entirely, as ultimately, isn't that what all researchers hope for? So, when we actually started to go somewhere, we were on high alert, making sure that all of our equipment and devices were set up and peering into the waters. Then we waited. That happens in a lot of these situations. There is a bit of excitement and then a whole lot of waiting. Like fishing. We're used to it. And you wouldn't know, just when you're starting to think about calling it a day, the sonar reader started going mad and something was coming up upon us and moving very fast. The readings were showing that whatever creature this was, it was large, really large. And to be honest with you, we were worried for a fleeting moment that if it collided with the boat, it might have capsized us. Yes, it appeared that big. It seemed to be circling us and I began to hope like mad that it wasn't some sort of prehistoric mammoth shark, as it was unlikely we would be able to present any research if we were in its stomach. Using the equipment at hand, we were able to see the mass of its body was far bigger than any usual creature around here, and also very, very long in length. And then, for just one beautiful and terrifying moment, this thing rose its head out of the water. And here's the thing. The best way I can possibly describe it was having a huge bulbous body, akin to something like a manatee. But instead of their placid demeanor and almost kind, curious face, the fierce and hungry look of a shark. Basically, this thing looked like a manatee and a shark had made it and this monstrosity was the offspring. It even appeared to have tendrils around its body. Can you imagine this? The full body with the head full of angry razor teeth, and it kind of had a distorted face. It rammed the boat incredibly hard, and we rocked and took on the water. I don't think it rammed the boat with too much force, because we didn't capsize. I don't think it was trying to sink us. I think it was just passing through. Part of me thought that we should stay as long as possible and try and document this amazing sighting, film it, take as many photos as possible for any evidence. However, I'm also a husband and father, as was my colleague, so we decided to book it and wrap it up. We fired up our boat and out of there we went. Luckily. It wasn't some killer shark that was hell-bent on following us and killing us. It did not follow us, and when it resubmerged, we never saw it after that. 
there have been plenty of other sightings of this same creature by locals, but sadly nothing verifiable. One day, I hope to get out there again, but not without a weapon. I work on the docks, and I've seen some real weird stuff over the years, and unfortunately, even had the calamity of finding a body washed up on shore once. I'll never forget the awful and strangely sad sight, but it didn't scare me. It wasn't gross like in the movies, but that's not what I'm writing to tell you about. On an early morning, I was down doing my usual, unloading from a docker that had come in from Europe and needed to head back as soon as possible. I was the only crew there at the time, and the workers with the cargo had nipped off to find some breakfast before heading back. It was still fairly dark, as it was so early, but that was fine. When I was aboard, I saw the waters on the far side start to churn up a bit. There are all sorts of things that live in the water. Most of them don't bother us, and we don't bother them any more than we have to. The goals are more of a nuisance than anything down below the surface. But I was mildly curious as whatever was in there was just making a real racket. Then I saw the strangest thing. I can only describe it as an octopus. I have no idea. I don't know if it was deformed or what, but it rose slightly out of the water. It was just like it was missing parts of its body. It looked malnourished or mutated. It was very strange. Is this making any sense? At the end of each of its tentacles, it seemed to be another weird appendage. Bear with me on this. Like each of the little suction cups had little teeth or little sharp appendages. The thing not even 10 feet away was like nothing that I have ever seen or known to exist. I must have stood there, staring at it for several minutes. It didn't attempt to move any closer. In fact, I'm not entirely sure if it even noticed me or if that was possible. It just spun around a few times, churning up the water so it was like a mud bath. And then it vanished and shot back under the water. That was when I heard shouting and footsteps and heard the others returning. I stood there a moment more, but it did not resurface and I never saw it again. When I told a couple of my colleagues, the majority of them must have thought I had one too many beers the night before and was still hangover drunk. Things like this don't exist, but who knows? Maybe I saw a rare species of octopi that occupy these waters. Besides, my family's originally from somewhere in Scandinavia, and I come from a long line of dock workers and fishermen. So, my family and I, yeah, we've seen some stuff. That's my story. I hope it serves you well. I was in holiday in the Caribbean at the time, and if you've ever been there, you'll know just how warm and beautiful the water truly is. We were staying in a very expensive and exclusive hotel, which came with its own private beach access and area. And in one part of that beach was a secluded cove with excellent rocks for diving off of, if you were brave enough. I was out there one day with my sister, and for once we were the only ones there probably because it was raining. Now, in our minds, what on earth did it matter because you are going to get wet anyway? But I guess a lot of the guests preferred lying on the beach and reading, so they had all retreated to the pool area as that was covered. There were a few people in the main part of the water, taking advantage of the waves, but it was just me and Cassidy. We were taking turns diving off the rocks, and see who could get the furthest out and who could swim back the fastest. You know, that kind of thing. It was her turn in the water, with me 
lining up, getting ready to jump in, when I heard her shout. It didn't seem like a yell of distress, so I did not jump to go in and help, but instead stood on the rock looking down at her as I called. There's a mermaid, she called back to me. Being 15 at the time, and her being 12, we were sensible kids, and not too far from our parents, who were up by the hotel bar. We were strong swimmers, and they did trust us. I also thought that Cassidy was a little too old to still believe in such things like mermaids. But sometimes, when you are on holiday, you revert back to being a little kid, like when we went to Disney, and she was still happy to be a princess. She was in no need to grow up too fast. I laughed at her and asked her if Ariel was there too. Laughing at my own joke, I dived in to join her. I asked where the mermaid was. So there I am, looking all around for this mermaid, wondering what Cassidy is referring to. When I see ripples in the water, followed by a very quick splash of what looked to be a tail. Now, when you have been laughing at your sister for making up imaginary mermaid friends, and then you suddenly see a splash, it did make me slightly apprehensive. It had to be a big, friendly fish, right? So, I added to her, what makes you think that she is a mermaid and not a fish? My sister looked at me, totally deadpan, and said she had a human head. More ripples, and then a closer splash, and I see more of the fish. It looked way bigger than I remotely am comfortable with, so I suggested to her that now might be a good time to leave and head back to mom and dad. I can't leave her, she had told me. She wanted to be friends with her. I told her not now, and it was not the time or the place. The ripples in the water started coming closer to us, as if whatever was down there was coming right up to the surface. And then it appeared. If you want to think of it as a mermaid, fine. But I'll always equate them to being mythical half-women, but with a fish tail. This thing was almost entirely fish, but with a grotesque-looking face and head. Yeah, it was humanoid, but it was ugly. I cannot stress enough how utterly terrifying it was. It kind of reminded me of a cross between Nosferatu's face and the goblins from the Lord of the Rings movies. I mean, it was ugly. The skin on both the head and the fish part were black and kind of rotted and gray looking. It certainly didn't look anything like Ariel. It had huge slits for eyes and a sl and a small sunken in nose and mouth, which it appeared to open and close, but there were also gills on the neck where it appeared to fuse into the body. I have never been so afraid in my life. I screamed, and for a moment, I thought it might attack, but it merely backed away and then swam off. I'll never forget its expression. It was kind of like an uh-oh. I wasn't supposed to be seen. I made a mistake. If you can believe it, Cassidy was actually more upset with me that I had offended her friend than being frightened by its hideous appearance or the fact like nothing like that should ever exist, and if it did, should never be witnessed by human eyes. I made her come back to shore and the hotel, and I feigned illness for the rest of the trip, so I would not have to go back down there. And of course, Cassidy only being 12 wasn't allowed down there on her own. She never did mention it again, but I often still wake up, nearly 10 years later, thinking about that same thing now. It should have not been possible. I think we were lucky that day, as I truly believe there was something wrong, as that would be inherently evil. Something that should have only been too happy to tear us limb from limb. Maybe it was a mermaid, or maybe it was a siren. I don't know. I don't know too much about old tales or stories of the sea. Maybe it is the reason for unexplained deaths. I don't know but it was the most awful, horrendous monstrosity 
I have ever seen, and not a day passes when I wish to God that I hadn't seen it. I was fishing with my uncle during a rather cold season when there was a slight mist hugging the surface of the Mississippi River. We've been out on the river most of the day, and we could feel that the air was starting to get colder with the way the sun was threatening to go behind the clouds. Without any warning, the line on my rod went taut. At first, I thought I'd hooked something stationary, like a rock, but rocks don't trash around like that. It was insane. Try as I may, I could not reel in whatever I had caught with my own strength. I thought for sure that I was going to lose the line, and possibly my rod. My uncle, ever the solution-oriented one, grabbed the net and got close to the edge of the boat as the thrashing got close. I wasn't able to watch as closely as I'd liked because I was trying to keep my line from getting away from me. My fishing pole wasn't a cheap one. Neither did I want a catch like this to get away, whatever it was. My uncle thrust his net into the water, and for a moment, I couldn't make out anything to speak of. But I swear, in a flash of things, I saw a hand reach out of the white water and grab his arm. He yelled and staggered. I was so caught off guard that I broke my concentration and my fishing line snapped. I went to check on my uncle and he looked like he had just seen a ghost. I asked him about the possibility of a hand coming up out of the water and grabbing him. He denied it, very forcefully. But the truth was in plain sight, and it was written even more on his face. I did not push the matter, because I knew what I had seen. In fact, a few years later, with the help of a little bourbon, he brought it up and admitted what I had known all along. He added some details that I missed. The hand that grabbed him was scaly and had only four fingers with narrow black nails. He had messed himself on the spot. Another detail that completely got by me. It's funny because I'd always thought that monster stories didn't belong someplace as ordinary as the Mississippi. I am one of those foolish people that does things that I probably shouldn't like exploring underwater caves on a very amateur level. In fact, you'd be surprised at how many there really are that are undocumented. Most of them are far too small to even be worth anybody's time putting on a map, hence why they are undocumented. By far, the vast majority of them aren't very safe. There's really only one way to find out which ones are safe and which ones are not. The one discovery that almost led me to giving up what I do for good came to me when I started exploring off the coast of California. It was just a clear enough day that I could see the ghost of what I was looking for hovering under the surface of the water. I thought it might be a wrecked ship that still had some sort of buoyancy, but snorkeling underneath revealed it to be a small underwater cavern and a chasm beneath. I geared up and went in. Most caverns have a point where they either get bigger or smaller. This did neither. It was the same consistent width the entire time and the entire length that I was in. I started wondering what could make a natural formation of a long rocky tube. The passageway was so narrow that there was no way I would be able to turn around. I would have to move backwards when I was ready to leave. That moment came sooner than I expected. With my light ahead of me, I came around a large bend in the tube, and there in front of me was what I first thought was a fissure lined with strange rocks. But the fissure started opening and shutting, bubbles escaping slightly. The rock wall the fissure was set in started moving towards me. It dawned on me to my horror that I was looking at the mouth lined with teeth. It was all I can do to keep myself from panicking as I backed up at the most painful, slow pace I had ever been forced into. 
The mouth ahead of me wasn't very speedy, but it was faster than I, and it was going to gain on me. When I finally made it to the edge of the cavern, I pushed off backwards with my hands, and the mouth braced itself against the lip of the tube, and it shot out at me with explosive force. The mouth snapped mere inches away from my face, the force pushing me back. I distantly realized that I needed to get out of the water, because I would soon go unconscious, a feat that I had just barely accomplished. I have read about tube worms and other things, but I never read about them getting that big, especially ones that had a mouth, like that with the hinged jaw. I'm lucky to be alive, and have been reconsidering my thrill-seeking habits. I tried talking myself into another expedition someplace, but I just couldn't bring myself to it. My grandpa had the unique privilege of going around the area that surrounds Loch Ness. Now, I know there's enough of these stories to fill an entire library, and this story isn't necessarily impressive, but it is special, at least special to him. He was friends with somebody who was an older gentleman when my grandfather was just a boy, a friend of the family, and he knew that my grandfather had an affinity for monsters and strange creatures of all kinds. And when you're that age, going out on the lock is enough to get you a thrill because you're anticipating the sight of the attack of the monster at any time. However, the monster never attacked, at least not in the way you thought. One afternoon, two of them had taken their lunch out onto the lock. My grandfather expressed the need to relieve himself. So, the two got up out of the boat after docking it and found a nearby place like a rock or a bush. While my grandfather was relieving himself, he swears to this day he saw something with a long neck and a narrow head come up out of the water, sniff about the boat, and eat what food that was there. My grandfather was so beside himself he almost forgot to pull up his pants. His friends could scarcely believe what had just happened, and my grandfather says that he was white as the clouds in the sky. The man never fully acknowledged what happened, and he never denied it either. My grandfather treasured that experience for the rest of his life, until he passed. My best friend gave up any kind of water exploration or scuba diving. He was completely shaken up by something that had happened when he went diving, looking for leopard seals. Now, I know what you're thinking. Leopard seals sounds like a pretty scary predator, but when they encounter humans, they're completely different. They treat humans like guests, and they often invite them to play. And sometimes, in a sort of grisly hospitality, a leopard seal will try to kill a penguin for a nearby human. My friend got pretty good at finding where the leopard seals like to swim. He couldn't do it very long at a time because the temperatures of the water, but the times that he got to were memorable. The day came when the leopard seal tried to make friends with my friend down to greater depths. She would dive sharply down below and then come up waiting to see if you would follow. Technically, you could have, but you would have to be very careful because that's where the waters got even colder and would be dangerous to humans. Finally, he followed her one day and she showed him something that he didn't think was possible given the environment. Cold water fauna isn't unheard of, but she had led him to a place down below where it was just absolutely thriving with bizarre forms of corals and animal formations that, as far as my friend knew, had never been discovered. I know that's an extremely bold statement, especially coming from him, who's a very credible and valid individual, but I honestly believe him. He forgot the discomfort of intense cold just long enough to start looking around. He was getting into a very strange patch of coral when he said this leopard seal friend attacked him, or thought that's what was happening. 
She forcefully pushed him aside as the coral that he had been looking at writhed up and shot up with jet engine force. The extensions ripped through her body and spikes exploding from her back. Just like that, the animal was paralyzed or killed. My friend hoped that she was killed because she was dragged down into the ground or some sort of awful mouth, he described it, took her. The experience thoroughly shook him up and he has not gone diving since. He still tells stories about that particular leopard seal and I could tell that he feels bad for what happened to her. After all, he feels she did save his life and he won't fully disclose this exact location because he's worried others might try and find it. I prefer to remain anonymous because my family is mostly involved in different kinds of over-the-sea piracy. I'm sorry, but it's the only way some of us can get by. I harbor no ill will towards the people that me and my comrades raid and rob, but the world has left people like me behind and I'm not ready to just roll over and die before I'm even 50. When you're already considered the scum of the earth, you will see and experience things that most people in this world don't. One of her better hauls had won us some scooping diving gear. We didn't know how to use it, and it would be several months before we actually did, because it meant that we would be able to investigate things that had already sunken underwater. One dive led to the discovery of what appeared to be an old tanker. I didn't think it would be likely we would find anything, but my friends were eager to look inside just in case, as if they didn't have anything better to risk their lives for. There was a very peculiar thing on the ship. There was a large metal chest that had been bolted to the starboard hull, almost like it was something meant to stay secret, although it seemed to me that having something like that in your ship was about as secret as a pimple on your forehead. Two of my comrades went underwater with bolt cutters to see if they can get inside. Minutes passed by, and then an hour. We were growing concerned because we did not know how much oxygen that they had. So, two more of my friends went underwater with them. I sat on the boat and stared at where the wreckage had been found, waiting for some sign of life or anything. Fifteen minutes had passed, and I began to get more worried. I put on my own scuba gear and I went underwater, not with the game of going where they went, but just seeing what was going on if they needed help. That's when I noticed a cloud of red water greeting me as soon as I went under. It was coming from the chest and the lid was dangling. There was some kind of ropey slithering movement and the unmistakable shape of a chewed up skull. The friends of my comrades and their families do not buy my story one bit. All they know is that they had left me and they didn't come back. But I swear, my story and I, it's part of the reason that I've been trying to get out of piracy. There's some things that simply aren't worth the risk. My uncle is kind of a blowhard. He has all his fancy stuff and he barely knows how to take care of it. Like his boat, he knows how to start it, but he has absolutely no idea how to maintain the thing, and his clumsiness follows him wherever he goes, including over the waves. We had gotten well over the water, and it was one of those things where he invited me out there just to show off all of his stuff. It's not like he hasn't given me the waterside tour of his estate. Admittedly, it is impressive looking back on the Florida coast and seeing his home rise like a futuristic white tower by itself, but it's not as impressive the fourth or fifth time. I was just enjoying being out on the water. So far out, he killed the motor and decided it was time to just enjoy ourselves. That had been my plan all along. I laid back pretending to listen to him talk about how much money he had made and what he was planning on buying. I was about to fall asleep when I felt the boat lurching slightly. So, 
open my eyes just in time for him and I to exchange the same look. I looked over at the side of the boat, just in time to see the hull of the boat, nudged by something that clearly had the body of your average shark. But it had the arrangement of eyes that you would expect from a spider. It must not have been an accident, because when it surfaced, it started shooting sticky web-like strands at us. Part of it got on my uncle's arm, and it was so sticky it nearly ripped off the skin. And there was a huge mad scramble to start the boat and get out of there. The boat then struggled against the strength of the silk, or whatever you call it. I don't know what the hell it was, but at last it ripped free, just a few seconds from land, and some of the silk must have found its way into the propeller blade. When we did get back on land, my uncle capitalized on the opportunity to phone out and announced that we had discovered some new species of animal. Apparently, the sticky substance was too similar in composition to things excreted by things like sea cucumbers, so he wasn't taken very seriously. Not that people were in any habit of taking him seriously to begin with. Anyway, that's my run-in with something I never experienced before in the ocean. And while it was a crazy experience, it still kind of scares me and keeps me from wanting to go out into the deep ocean to this day. I man a lifeguard station next to the coast off of Maine. There's just enough traffic of both people and watercraft that somebody like me and my team need to be nearby at all times. I've been looking into getting a different line of work ever since one particular incident when our little hub was being remodeled and updated and there would need to be somebody to spend the night there so as to make sure that none of the copper or other exposed valuable pieces would get stolen. After the working hours were over, I took advantage of the opportunities to just sit and stare at the water something I didn't get to do too much of when I was on duty, because there was always something to do, and something to always check up on. After a while, I noticed something in the water that I couldn't quite make out. It drifted into the setting sunlight at such an angle that I could tell it was the nose of a small boat that had capsized. My rescuer instincts kicked in, and I got prepared to go out there and make sure everything was okay. There's a half-submerged door in the boat, and I knocked on it several times to see if there's any way I could hear movement, or even hopefully, somebody might kick back. Took the extra step of putting my ear underwater and pressing it to other parts of the boat just to see if I could hear anything. And there was nothing. That didn't mean people couldn't be unconscious in there. I got out of the water and went back inside. I was able to pick up my cell phone and call for emergency services when there was a single loud thudding knock on my own door. I can't tell you looking back now why I seized up. Something about it wasn't quite right. The feeling intensified when the knock came again, but it was accompanied by a very strange gurgling. It sounded deep and throaty and it almost made me want to vomit. There were several more knocks, and after that, I heard the sound of heavy wet footsteps trailing away from the door. I straight have been quiet for a few minutes. I worked up the bravery to investigate. I saw some very large wet and mighty footprints leading to the back of my door. I followed them to the water, where it looks as if something had come out of the water and decided to pay me a visit. That's the worst I'd ever slept in my life. Not only did I lock the door, I barricaded it. I wasn't sure if I would've had the nerve to get up and investigate if something like a burglar showed up to steal any valuable metals. I'm well over six foot and built like I was going to try out for Jersey Shore, if that tells you anything. The footprints, on the other hand, no, they weren't human, nor did they look like shoes. They were weird four-toed footprints, larger than any footprints man could leave. I am very disturbed from this whole ordeal, to say the least.
I am sure you're no stranger to terrifying, large and harrowing fish found out at sea by fishermen, just like many of the details you describe in your accounts listed on your channel. Well, I too have an interesting story about a very large, what I'll call an unknown fish, while I was cage diving with great white sharks off the coast of Mexico many years back, at around 2002 to be exact. I'll spare you all the boring details about going out there on the boat, who I was with, getting suited up, and getting into the cage, because that's pretty redundant. But anyway, great white shark diving is something that's amazing, and if you ever get the chance to do it, it's quite an adrenaline thrill. In fact, I was loving it and having the time of my life. I'm not really what you'd call an adrenaline junkie or even a thrill seeker, but this was something that I had to cross off my bucket list at least once. Anyway, here's where things become crazy. So I'm in the cage watching these beautiful and large majestic fish swim all around me, knowing I'm literally within 20 feet of a man-eating predator or, as Hollywood portrays them to be, there's about three of them swimming around me, and that's when I notice their sudden disinterest of swimming around me, if that makes any sense. They kind of start to trail off towards the other directions, out into the open sea, and as I begin to sit there confused, wondering why they're no longer swimming around me, I begin to see that deep below me, underneath me, a very, very large shape is beginning to emerge closer to the surface. Now, at first, I thought this might be a whale, but this shape, whatever it was, never fully surfaced enough that I could really make out vivid details. All I could really tell you is that it was a very, very large dark shadow of something, and it seemed to be moving. Maybe it was a craft of some kind. It's hard to say. It looked very long, like if you were to take a sperm whale and enlarge it even more. I'm terrible at describing things, but the best way I can describe it is it was some large marine animal, or fish, or something, that was much, much larger than any great white that I've ever seen. But again, I can't give you great details, because it never fully surfaced enough, even in the water, that I could make out what it was. What I can only assume, looking back on the event, is that this thing approaching us made the great white sharks flee. Now, you tell me what lurks beneath. What's out there in the ocean that the sheer presence of a fish makes great white sharks even flee? So, that's something that's left for another day of mystery. And I'm not kidding when I say that the shape of this thing was massive. It engulfed the entire underneath of my cage. And again, it was just a black mass. I couldn't tell what it was. But it seemed to go in front of me, below me, and behind me. For maybe only a moment or two before submerging back down into the depths to where I couldn't see it anymore. After that, the shark stayed gone, and once I went back up to the boat, I didn't tell them what happened. I only mentioned how the sharks just seemed to lose interest, and that was it. It didn't really scare me as much as it makes me think about all the mysteries the ocean holds. I feel foolish for saying this, but I think I saw something that might have been out of place, whatever that means. I was at my grandfather's lake house out in the woodland area of Louisiana last summer when I had an encounter with some kind of creature, or I guess it would be a lake creature. I know that sounds crazy, like some sort of Hollywood movie plot, but I promise you, the truth is stranger than fiction. I couldn't fully understand or describe what it was, so I'm hoping somebody can help me identify what it might be. And after doing some researching, you seem to have a series about lake and sea creatures, which just might be my ticket to getting a resolution. My dad and I have gone fishing a few times during the summer every year to fish out on the lake. It was just like any other trip this time. We got our gear together, did our traditional cola pop chug and rode out into the lake. Normally, I will row around till dad is satisfied and we have found the right spot. I hooked my bait onto the hook and whisked it into the water. Dad got a bite almost immediately. He pulled out a three inch trout, which would explain how he caught it so fast. See, 
Baby adolescent fish aren't smart enough to stay away from your bait, yet even know what it is, so they're easier to catch. We don't take our phones out on the boat, so I can't ever accurately judge what time it was, besides looking at the sun. I would say maybe 45 minutes after he caught his, I finally had a bite. It definitely was a fighter. After relentlessly pulling and leading it in, I was starting to pull it out of the water with a larger fish snagged it from me, hook and all. I hooked my line again and threw it back into the water. I don't know what it was, but larger fish always love taking my smaller bites. Luckily, I had another bite a little while later and I was determined to not let this one get away from me. I let it lead around for a little while before starting to reel it in hard. I waited long enough to seem as if it caught the fish off guard. I pulled it in very quickly and was pulling it out of the water when I saw another fish trying to snag it from me. I pulled it out quickly, but that didn't stop the other fish from jumping out of the water to bite it as I pulled it away. It wasn't much larger than the 11 fish I pulled out of the water, but it definitely was a predator. It landed back on the water, and oddly enough, it stared at me for a minute before swimming back under the water. It was a pale blue fish with weird yellow and brown eyes. It didn't look like it had scales, but almost looked like it had skin. Thinking about it, I'm not quite sure it was a fish at all. Its head resembled a fish, but it didn't look like a fish that I had ever seen before. I told Dad that I had to use the restroom, and that I thought I was done for the day. I didn't tell him what I had seen, but I think the lake and the heat were messing with my head. It was quite hot out, and I think I just needed to lie down to get rid of the ominous headache that I was having. We went out again the next day. I chose a different spot on the lake for us just in case whatever I saw yesterday happened to still be there. It took a while for either of us to get a bite on our lines, and whatever happened to the fish must have happened overnight. I told my dad that we must have caught all the fish yesterday, and that the lake was out for the summer. He laughed at me, and said we should find another spot because, after being in the spot for the same two hours and not finding anything, it was considered bad luck. So. I rode over to a spot near the edge of the lake on the farther side of the lake that faced the woodlands. Not much activity was happening until my father got a fish. I don't know what he caught, but it was very large. He was losing his grip of the pole when I held onto the pole and the fish came out of the water. It must have been a 16 inch fish. Something like that was enormous, but that isn't what surprised me. What did was the gigantic bite that was taken out of the side of it. It was so heavy because we were fighting with something that was already eating it. I looked around in the water, and I could see faint glowing yellow-brown eyes. Then I realized it was the same thing from the other day. My dad got kind of spooked after pulling that thing out, so he decided to call it. We rode back to shore. We had to go to the store to find something for dinner since we hadn't caught any fish that day, except that half-eaten one that we pulled out of the lake. Dad said he wasn't getting as much excitement out of fishing this year. I told him if tomorrow didn't go any better, then I would be okay with heading home early. The next morning, I woke up early and went out to the lake to sit on the dock. I watched the water as the sun rose. I didn't see any fish in the water from where I was. Normally, you can come out here and see the whole lake move as if it were an orchestra of watercolors. Not today, though. The lake was still, as if all the fish were gone. I looked across to the area where we were yesterday, and I saw a fawn coming out of the woods towards the edge of the water. I watched it as it stumbled across the ground and dipped its head to the water to drink from it. It was so peaceful until something long and pale came out of the water and bit onto its neck, pulling it in. I stood up frantically, looking around to see if it made it out. But after 10 minutes, I could assume what happened. I just sighed and went back inside. I walked into the kitchen to find Dad drinking his coffee. I told him about the lake, and that there were no fish, 
that they probably had already moved on already, and there wasn't any use staying another day to fish. I didn't tell him what happened to the fawn, though. He was disappointed, but he knew I was right. We packed up all of our stuff and loaded it onto our truck. And just then in that moment, I turned to look back at the lake one last time. And I swear, just like out of some sort of nightmare, I swore I could have saw its faintly glowing eyes still staring at me from underneath the water. And then something far more horrifying had happened in that very moment. I heard some swooshing around, like something heavy under the dock. And that's when it came into view. The body, or should I say half-eaten body of the dead fawn from earlier, came out from floating underneath the docks into view. There really wasn't much left of it, other than a massive heap of torn up eaten flesh and a leg or two, which is the only real way you could even discern it was still a fawn, or was a fawn at one point. It's safe to say that me and my father don't go fishing out there anymore. I'm not really one to believe in sea monsters or anything strange or that supposedly doesn't exist, like fairy tales or mermaids, but I had a very strange thing happen to me with my friend and I back in May when we went fishing outside the coast of Florida. I'm not an experienced fisherman by any stretch of the means, but I do enjoy fishing as a hobby, and so my buddy Ryan is a pretty good fisherman. He goes off coast fishing all the time. At least, I believe it's called coast fishing. Well, that's what he calls it. So he's taken me a handful of times, but this time was just like any other time. And with the whole COVID thing going on, I figured a nice day fishing would have been good for both of us. Everything went pretty normal, up until a few hours after we were anchored, where we saw these large shapes start circling around our small boat. At first, I almost pondered if they were dolphins, but I thought dolphins come in bigger pods, and I don't know what kind and size they come in, but these seem to be a little bit bigger than a dolphin, and were shaped differently too. The weird thing was their behavior. They were shaped differently too, and they had a different color, if I'm making any sense at all. Like, they were dark. You couldn't really make out details, and they seemed to have long tails at the end of them, and they kept swimming in the groups of three that they came in. They would circle around our boat for a little bit, then swim out a little ways. Then they would swim back to us. It was strange, and I wasn't really sure what to make of it. Even my buddy Ryan was weirded out. We weren't sure what to do. We continued to cast our rods and just try and fish like normal, ignoring whatever these fish or marine life was. Well, they never got close enough to the surface that we were accurately able to see what they were. I'm going to go with dolphins, but dolphins still don't act like that, nor do they swim like that. And these things, whatever they were, hung around our boat for probably two to three hours. We weren't dumping chum in the water at all, so I'm not too sure if they were just curious about our boat or what. They never tried to jump on our lines either, so it wasn't the bait we had that was attracting them. It's still weird to think about. Now, it doesn't spook me because I'm not scared since I didn't see anything, but it's just, I don't know, I can't quite put a finger on it. My buddy even says that that was the weirdest, most strange fishing trip he's been on, and he's been on a lot of trips out into the ocean, at least with me anyway. Not my story, but a close friend of mine's who's been fishing for well over 25 years in the Gulf of Mexico the East Coast and the West Coast as well, and has caught all sorts of fish, including sharks and a host of other legal and illegal fish. I'm not gonna sit here and parade and advocate for those who catch sharks, but he's done it before. I'll keep the backstory pretty minimal, but I just want you to know that he's caught his fair share of fish, and so when he catches something out of the ordinary, it's gonna stand out in his mind. A few years ago, he was telling me he caught something very strange off the coast of Texas. What he caught, he described as eel-like, being very long and having these strange tendrils off the tail of its body that almost hung out behind it, kind of like the tentacles of a jellyfish. 
although they weren't jellyfish-like tentacles. It was a very strange-looking creature, he described. It was long like an eel, or like a serpent, but it didn't look like an eel. It kind of reminded him of a viper fish, and it was kind of bloated in the middle, and the length was around 8 to 9 feet in length, and about as thick as his torso. He said he had never seen a fish like it ever before, and wasn't exactly sure what to call it, or to classify it as. He took a picture, and sent it to one of his close fishing friends as well. They didn't know what the hell it was, and they had never seen anything like it either. But, him being him, didn't really put too much into it. He took it home, cut it up, and ate it, and apparently didn't kill him. I kinda wish he would've kept the picture, or at least kept the fish, so we could show people. But with his type of personality, he's not really the type of person to catch a new species of fish, get all excited about it. He could honestly care less. Whether he's seen it before or not, it's going on his grill and into his stomach. That's pretty much his attitude on it. With the whole quarantine thing going on lately, we ended up talking, and I somehow got on the topic of catching fish, and we talked about that for a while, in which I asked him what was the strangest catch he's ever had. And then that came to his mind and he told me about it. Anyway, I just thought I'd like to share this with you since you might find it interesting. I wanted to send you this email because just recently, I happened to stumble across your video series about lake and sea monsters and was blown away by the amount of stories you've received from fellow fishermen and sea adventurers. Even though I may not be a fisherman, or a sea adventurer by any means. I have many friends that are, and a couple off the top of my head that I know currently reside in England, and they have some crazy stories to tell. In fact, I'll have to put you in touch with them, because the stories they have will blow your mind. But there is one story that they shared with me recently, and although I might be terrible at retelling what they've told me, I can kind of tell you the gist of it. They were both fishing somewhere off the coast of England, I don't exactly know the location, because I don't quite remember if they relayed that to me, but they both told me something very large bumped the bottom of their boat, and then poked its head out of the water, probably not even 10 feet away, and looked at both of them. They were both shocked and scared, and keep in mind this was a dinky little fishing boat, not a tiny little wooden raft either, but definitely not a commercial fishing boat. They both described the creature to me as looking like some sort of aquatic dinosaur. It kind of resembled a sturgeon, is what they said, but had a very, very long neck and a tiny head that kind of looked prehistoric, is the best way they can describe it. It had its mouth open, but not in a menacing way, kind of just like how some fish or creatures have their mouth open. Whatever this thing was, it was close enough that they could tell it had tiny, serrated teeth and black eyes. It then dunked its head back under the water and continued as normal. Neither of them really have no idea why it bumped into their boat or what exactly it was, and I don't think they ever really described to me what its body looked like. They just told me about how large it was. They're thinking that whatever this thing was, right when it bumped their boat, must have not realized that it did it. So that's why it stuck its head out of the water to kind of assess its surroundings, which is why it seemed to stare blankly at my two friends and then resubmerge and continue on like nothing ever happened. They said its neck was incredibly long, easily 20 to 30 feet. And I'm not joking, it's not an exaggeration. And they said it was much longer than a giraffe's neck and the body of this thing had to have been massive, maybe 30 to 40 feet in length and the neck was probably around 20 to 30. They said it reached high above the water, and the head was probably roughly the size of a human torso, maybe three feet from the edge of the mouth to the back of the neck. Again, this is all just rough speculation on their end from what they saw about 20 feet away from this thing. They said it's almost impossible to know for absolute sure, but they said that's not the first time crazy stuff has happened off the coast of England. And while it is very frightening, they've assured me that weirder stuff has happened, and it's not the first time or the last they'll probably see something that isn't supposed to exist. 
or see something that we don't know about as mankind. I'm going to go ahead and keep their names anonymous, but one of them has a grandfather who's been a fisherman his entire life. He had a story in which years and years ago, I want to say it was back in the 70s or the 80s, his tiny ship was attacked by what they would describe as the Kraken. And I know that sounds kind of far-fetched, but the best way they put it in detail was it was some large octopi-like creature that was far larger than their boat that literally tried to drag them down to the depths. Of course, when it was told to me, my mind immediately went to the whole Pirates of the Caribbean Kraken scene, but I really don't think it was that large. But it must have been of significant size to be able to try and take a boat down. So who knows? After all, there are all sorts of large predatory creatures in the ocean. Some that live so deep will never ever know about their existence. I don't want to make this too long, so I'll go ahead and reach out to my friends and have them send you over some amazing stories, and we'll see where we can go from there. But in the meantime, just try and stay out of the ocean. It's obvious that there are things living in there that we can't even comprehend. After all, mankind is very arrogant in what we believe we have discovered and what ceases to exist, only for a few years later to find out that that was a lie and things actually do exist that we thought were long extinct. When I was a young boy, I used to enjoy watching my father fish. I suppose it was inevitable that I too would follow in my father's footsteps when I got older, and that I did. I worked as a fisherman for 40 years. I suppose the years drifted by quickly, and it's only now at the age of 87 that I pause to reflect on the past. I feel now is the right time to come forward about an experience that I had at age 19 in the summer of 1952. Me and two of my fellow colleagues were on our boat, pitching our rods off the Cornwall coast. We were looking for red salmon as we were getting a handsome check for providing a local butcher with fish. It was a hot summer day, and we had a few beers on the boat. Our t-shirts were off, and we were enjoying waving at a group of young ladies who were having a picnic on the coast. We didn't know the girls, but they beckoned us to come and join them for their picnic. It was certainly enticing for a 19-year-old, since I had been working as a fisherman apprentice for around five years at the time, and it was very rare that I ever encountered the opposite sex. The ladies continued beckoning us. The smell of their vanilla perfume seemed to gather and cluster around our boat. Its soft, feminine overtones were almost hypnotic, and filled me with youthful desire. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I laugh now as I write this, for a wise old man once said, The devil take the woman, and that following your youthful desire leads, well, you know. What occurred on that day was nothing but sheer madness, sheer terror and mesmerism. The other folks on board decided to jump overboard and swim towards the sand and walk up to meet the girls. I told them that it seemed like a good idea and encouraged them to go. As soon as they jumped over, the sky became very gray and it started to rain heavily. I watched as they struggled against an increasingly erratic wave. I glimpsed up at the girls and could see them jumping up and scurrying away, clearly frightened of the oncoming shower or perhaps reluctant to actually meet the guys. I began to think that it seemed too good to be true or if it was some kind of trick. The skies continued to pour and I noticed that my friends were struggling heavily. Then I witnessed a horror that makes my hands shake with fright. A large serpent-like creature shot out from the depths of the ocean, long, over 15 feet long, with a huge body, green and slimy, just like a sea snake. It had fangs which looked to be a foot long, and its head was protruding, about the same size as a human head. It was a disturbing sight, and just the memory alone terrifies me. The guys in the water noticed the serpent, and I noticed that it seemed to be hunting them. It was jagging at my friend, and then I saw signs of blood. I grabbed something nearby and threw it out in the direction which the serpent was now thrashing around, jumping in and out of the ocean, like a dolphin, but viciously 
and with clear intent to wound. The creature then turned around and noticed me and bolted towards me through the water. Its tail was huge. It shot up and tried to wound my face, but I managed to block it with an oar on the boat. It seemed like it was intent on striking at me, its fangs thrashing and hungry for human flesh it seemed. I was absolutely petrified beyond belief. I had never witnessed such a creature before, and at only 19 years old, I was still a virgin of the sea. Even my father had never heard anything like this or encountered anything. I attempted to wrestle with the beast, but I began to feel I was doomed. The serpent-like creature managed to mount the boat and was now facing me directly. The boat capsized slightly and seawater poured in my feet where we're now soaking. I knew that I was going to die, but I knew I would not give up without a fight. I continued kicking frantically at the beast, hoping that if I made contact with it, it would retreat in fear. But this beast looked just as vicious as it did hungry, and eventually I managed to hit it slightly with the oar, but the boat was now nearly underwater. All at once, suddenly, the storm had ceased overhead and this serpent-like creature descended back into the water. Things became still and calm, and I felt it was now safe to swim back, and as I did, my friends were nowhere to be seen. I found them later, and they had deep wounds and cuts from where this creature had attacked them, nearly almost bleeding out. When we told others of our experience, nobody believed us, but possibly some biologists felt it could have been a mysterious underwater creature undiscovered by science at the time. Whatever it was, it was terrifying, and I was glad to have never encountered it again during my fishing career. Look, I know it might sound outlandish, but this is a story that happened to me much when I was younger, and I haven't had anything like it since. I know there are crazy tales of sea experiences out there, and well, this is mine. Just remember that almost every fisherman out there has his or her own. Hi, what lurks beneath. Let me introduce myself. I'll go by the name David, and I am a primary school teacher from Northern Ireland. I came across your channel as I recently had a disturbing experience that has been wreaking havoc on my mental health. I've been off work now for one year, and don't see that I can reasonably go back at the moment. Not just because of COVID, but because of what I saw and witnessed during the summer of back in 2018. Every year, the teachers take the primary seven class, whom are all aged around 11 to a seaside resort. It's always such a fun and memorable weekend, and it's all to wish them a farewell before they go into secondary school. The weekend is always filled with all sorts of activities and fun. The kids love it, and so do the teachers. I have thoroughly enjoyed attending the annual trip for the last 10 years, but that was until 2018. I was the designated officer for a group of kids, and there was about five of them in total, and it was my job to take them out on a short canoeing excursion. This was just off the coast of Cork, and to say it was picturesque would be a complete understatement. I remember thinking how lucky I was to be Irish, and how blessed I was to have a job that allowed me to explore such beautiful spots and get paid for it all at the same time. We all took our canoe boats out, and all of us had life jackets. We also all had whistles in case we got into any kind of trouble. Most of the kids had been canoeing before, so had a knack for it. But there was one kid who was on the spectrum, autism, and had poor hand-eye coordination, who struggled to use his oar. He was high-functioning, so he wasn't a total vegetable. I had to help him and spend a little extra time with showing him the technique, but he eventually got the hang of it. He was just a little slower, but we all adjusted our speed to accommodate for him. There was a very small strand where we were sailing to and intended to stop for a little snack. I kept some juice in my backpack and some biscuits and fruit so all the kids would be satisfied and be fit for sailing back. The currents in the water started getting a little shaky and some of the kids said they were struggling to row. It was a bit worrying, 
but I could see that they weren't far from reaching the shore. The other kid who had been struggling, Dennis, was really starting to have issues. His oar had fallen into the water and sank, and he was beginning to panic. I told the others to row to shore, whilst I tied a bow onto Dennis's boat and pulled him with me. When I reached him, I noticed something large and green, like the shape of a cobweb almost under the water. I squinted downwards, but just brushed it off as some weird type of seaweed or something. But still, as I tied the bow around Dennis's boat, this thing kept encircling. It also seemed to pulsate, getting bigger, then smaller. I just hoped it wasn't a jellyfish or some dangerous sea animal. At that moment, as the water grew deathly still, I turned back to see the other kids and make sure they had reached safely ashore. As I squinted, a large serpent-like snake shot up from the sea and bit my forehead. It had a large fang that was sharp and now coated me with my own blood. I panicked like hell and shouted to Dennis to hop into my boat, but he was panicking even more now. This creature continued to emerge from the water like lightning bolts and shoot its way across my head, attempting to bite me. It was the most frightening experience of my life. I was being attacked on water with a very vulnerable child, but on top of that, I had never seen such an aggressive sea creature. I had also been bitten and could already feel my forehead expanding, no doubt as a reaction to whatever venom was released in this bite. This snake, whatever it was, wasn't very large, probably the size of a normal rattler, but it was enough to be aggressive and hostile, and I had no idea how venomous it could have been. From what I understand, sea snakes are extremely venomous. I cursed and panted. Eventually, I managed to get the bow on Dennis's boat and started sailing like hell. This creature shot up again, its eyes like slits, yellow and soulless but speaking a clear fury and intent to kill me. I did the best I could to try and avoid it, but to no avail. The canoe boat shook and almost nearly capsized with the impact. Eventually, as we reached the shore, the beast seemed to abandon its endeavor and it left us in peace, small but deadly. As I carried Dennis out of the boat, he was coated in a cold sweat. The rest of the kids ran up to us and hugged us, they had seen it all where we were traumatized. All of the kids were white with shock and needed to get water and food immediately. We called an ambulance and told them what had happened. I got first aid and got my wound dressed. Luckily, the venom wasn't lethal, but I have to admit, the venom of that incident has lived on in my psyche every day since then. Every moment, every day, I feel the terror and stress I felt in that boat as I fought for my life and that of the little kid entrusted to my care. I sincerely feel I will never go back on that boat again and am reluctant to even go near the water. The last I heard of the kids, two had dropped out of school and were being homeschooled for the time being, and Dennis had completely retreated into himself. Obviously, what we saw had a scaring effect on all of us. I hope that in writing about this experience, you can maybe enlighten me and inform me if other such creatures exist and have been sighted by others in the sea nearby. I know it was some sort of sea serpent, nothing crazy like Leviathan or anything, but I've never ran into a sea serpent so aggressive before. I mean, this thing was intent on bringing me down, so much so that I almost capsized our canoe. Anyway, I would like to thank you all for all the hard work you do. It is truly appreciated. People say that the things you experience as a child can shape you. The lessons we learn, both good and bad, help to form the adult you become. And that there will be some encounters, experiences, things you go through in life that will forever haunt you. Whether that is true for most folks, I don't know, but what I do know for certain is this. I will never, ever forget the day of my 16th birthday. It was the end of summer, and we had not long to start back at school. 
the evenings were still drawn out, but starting to bring a very welcome suggestion that it was finally starting to cool down a little bit. I was fortunate that my birthday fell at the weekend, so me and a whole bunch of my buddies spent the afternoon at the lake. I can remember my grandfather telling stories about some creature that he had supposedly been sighted out on the lake back when he was a boy. He hadn't seen anything himself, but it had been the talk of the town at the time, besides a couple of old newspaper reports that were framed in the town hall. It just became a legend that was whispered about around the campfire. You know well those kinds of stories, and if you've ever been in Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts, you probably know well what I'm talking about. Of course, once you get a bunch of excited kids all riled up after a day in the sun, some of us may be looking to impress a certain girl. Talk of the famous yet mysterious late creature was inevitable, as was the dare for a couple of us to stay at the lake after dark and see if we could be the ones to wake it from its 50 odd year slumber. Bravado is one thing at the daytime, and if I hadn't been buoyed by the look in the girl's eyes, I wouldn't have found myself sitting on the shore of the lake at 2 a.m. whilst my buddy had the good sense to doze off. Of course he would do that. He was always that kind of kid that always let me take the fall for things, and in this case, he wanted it easy while I decided to be the brave one. I can't say I was scared, not then anyway, but I was certainly on edge a little. I mean, even though they were just stories, you can't tell me you wouldn't be nervous too, sitting on the lakeside, expecting something to happen, and then continuously telling yourself it's just a story. I didn't believe for one second that I would actually see anything, but your eyes play tricks on you when you only have a campfire and the beam of your torch to see by. It makes for a very haunting atmosphere, if I do say so myself. That was when I heard the noise. Splashing, actually. Coming from what sounded like the middle of the lake. Fairly quiet, but unmistakably silent in the night. My first stupid thought was a shark, or even an alligator. Even though this was just a plain lake. Not sea or swampland. And there never have been reports of either of those things here. I even kind of chuckled at the thought of it in the moment, feeling foolish and very silly. After my brain kicked in, I stood up carefully and crept ever closer to the shoreline. Then, I shone the powerful torch out onto the lake. I think the only reason I didn't drop the damn thing was that I was frozen with fear to start. I'll likely never be able to accurately describe what I saw as my eyes didn't want to believe it but I'll try the best I can. Despite being a fair way out, I could see its head very clearly, thanks to the illumination of the beam. It resembled that of an alligator, but instead of the powerful, flattish torso, this thing looked like it was attached to a long, thick spine. Kind of like maybe, I don't know, an anaconda? The splashing was being made by what I presumed with its tail, which was long and very long away from its head, meaning this thing was huge. That was when it turned, as if sensing the light from the shore. I caught one glance of those wild lizard-like eyes. They almost glowed a very dull yellow. I remember screaming and dropping the light. Of course, my scream woke up my buddy and by the time I'd picked it back up, he joined me with his own. There was nothing. No more noise. And sure as hell, no more sightings of anything of that. Over the following months, all sorts of people headed back down to the lake. Kids with their phones, even scientists, and even biologists from what I was told. But nothing. Anyway, I know what I saw that night. I still see its face in my dreams and in my sleep. I'll never forget it. It's something so out of the ordinary, so out of our world, that you can't mistake it. 
There was no other fish or animal it could have been. I can't believe it actually exists. My father was a fisherman, and whenever he had some free time, he was always spending it out on the lake. Sometimes he'd travel to experience different places, catch different kinds of fish. In fact, he actually spent a lot of time traveling to different areas of the country, different states, visiting the prime fishing locations, whether it be on a lake or even by sea. Whenever or wherever we went on vacation, somewhere for my father to enjoy his favorite pastime was always of utmost importance. He'd caught all sorts of things over the years and won several prizes, as he attended fishing competitions even. In fact, he even had a photo in his local diner holding a huge fish that he brought back that same day and cooked it for a special meal. One time, I remember he was really excited as mother had finally convinced him we could go on a cultural visit to New Orleans and he could visit the bayou. Whilst my mother and I enjoyed jazz and all the other amazing things New Orleans offers, my father was setting up all the best equipment ready for a long day in the swampy rivers. And just so you know, the bayous and the swamps outside of New Orleans aren't necessarily safe. They can get very dangerous very quickly to those who are unexperienced and don't know what they're doing. Mother and I got back to the hotel late, intending to freshen up before heading back out to try some prized New Orleans gumbo. My father was often gone for hours at a time, sometimes crawling back into bed late out at night, only to wake us up in the morning with tales of wonders and amazement from lakes. But we were real surprised to find him back in the hotel room before us, and looking very pale and shaky. Not his normal at all. He's done and seen a lot, and he doesn't get scared, especially from fishing. Mother had been concerned that he might have seen an alligator, but even then, unless he had a one-on-one -on -one wrestling match, there's no reason he should be afraid of an alligator. But my father shook his head when prompted with the question. He'd taken his shotgun with him, just in case, but what he'd seen wasn't a reptile, or so he said. I remember asking him, what was it? What does that even mean? He told me that he ain't never seen anything that looked like this. I remember just how scared he was. He shook his entire body as he explained. This thing he saw ain't like anything he's ever seen. My father told me that Mama had been sitting enjoying the calmness and hoping to snag a catfish or two, which, by the way, catfish are some of his favorite. Although, compared to other fish, I can't stand the flavor. Anyway, he started to pull the line in with such force, it damn near dragged the whole thing into the water. He grabbed a hold of it, intending to reel it in, and feeling excited about what he might find. But the line snapped with the force of whatever was pulling on the other end. My father at this point grew very frustrated and frightened, grabbed his net with his long pole, wafting it around the water, trying to find what had just caused his line to break, and he suddenly, from what he explained to us, caught sight of this catch. I swear at that point, he was even more pale. His forehead became even more shiny, and he began to become really clammy. It's like he was going through a nervous breakdown, just telling us this. It scared me. I had never seen him look like that. My mom, her eyes getting so big, asked what in God's name did you see? At first, my father explained that he thought it was a huge snake, and explained that it was huge, had a very thick reptilian body, but was completely white. I thought it was maybe some kind of albino river snake. I could just see its long body. But then he said the hen came up to the surface, and this is where I thought he was going to cry. It wasn't no snake. He said it had a face that was like a giant sandworm. No eyes, just a huge gaping mouth 
that peels open from its head. And the teeth, the teeth on this thing, were just monstrous. This creature looked like something out of the Star Wars universe. It didn't make any sense. Well, the rest of our time there on vacation, he stayed out of the bayou. And in fact, going completely out of character, did not fish for the rest of the time we were there. Which, again for him, it's all this man ever does or knows. It took him weeks to finally get the courage to go back fishing at all. I've spent time googling and researching over the years, but never found any other sighting of a supposed giant albino sandworm type of river monster in Louisiana or any nearby areas. But I knew someday I'd find somebody to share the story with. Only my mother and I know. I haven't even told my friends because it sounds very bizarre. But I'm telling you, my father doesn't make up stories. And why would he make this up and not go fishing the rest of the time we were on vacation? It would make no sense. So, everyone tells you, when you're out in the ocean, or on a small sailing boat with your mates, you have to be careful of sharks and all the other terrible things that are in the water. We all know that sharks are a thing to look out for. So, it makes sense that you don't go out somewhere without a shed load of protective gear if Jaws is supposedly around. Even an idiot knows that. But, what people tend to warn you about are sea monsters. Or, in this case, I should mention the things that people don't warn you about. This is simply because they are considered things of legends, lore, fairy tales. Am I right? See, here in the United Kingdom, we don't necessarily have shark-infested waters like much of the other parts of the world. Too bloody cold, I expect. But what we do have, well, to be perfectly honest with you, I haven't got a clue what they are. And no, in this particular case, I'm not talking about Nessie. We were off the coast of Scotland, so maybe, just maybe it was her cousin. Another dinosaur-like being roaming the free ocean. Me and some mates had decided to take a little fishing boat out, just for a bit of fun. A couple of the lads and I were on the beers, but I was feeling a bit dodgy. Turns out, I got a tad seasick, and my mate, who we'll call Jay, was in charge of making sure that we did not capsize. See, it's very important that you have somebody dedicated to this alone. Dan, who was on the beer, suddenly shouts out, Lads, Nessie has come to see us, and he's brought his girlfriend. Thinking Dan was trying to wind us up, and we just laughed and played along, looking over the side of the boat and pretending to be scared. Nearly got me there, I called back to him. I expected a slap on the back and a gotcha. Instead, Dan looked pissed off. He told me he wasn't joking, and he was quite serious. He explained to me there's something out there. Humoring him a bit longer, we looked over the side again, and this is the time we all saw them. It wasn't Nessie, as I said, since she is meant to be massive. That's not to say that these things were small. Each was roughly the length of a small boat, and as wide as a large man. There was many of them, and they seemed to have elongated necks, kind of like a giraffe, or what you would see in typical illustrations of a brontosaurus. But their body was much more aquamarine-like, kind of like a fish. They had little fin-like limbs, kind of just like a sea turtle has, but their heads were very reptilian, with huge wide amber eyes on the sides of their faces. Again, almost identical to your stereotypical illustration of a brontosaurus's face. We all stood watching, frozen in fear. Well, except Dan, who must have had our share of the beers as well, after proving his point. He nodded off on the floor of the boat. These things didn't try anything, just circled us a few times, 
following each other around and around. Then, as quick as they appeared, they were gone. Just like that, they had just submerged in the water and were gone without a trace, never to be seen. So, Jay hit the motor in that instance and we got the hell out of there. I have never really told anybody about it or until now because I didn't want to admit how scared I was. I don't think we saw a monster, even though I want to believe that. But maybe, the more I reflect back on it, we just saw a pod of living, breathing dinosaurs. Either way, I truly believe that we were lucky that day, and whatever those creatures were, dinosaurs or not, they weren't hungry to put up a fight. And thank God for that, because we would have all been goners for sure had they had a taste for meat, specifically human flesh. Deep sea diving is both breathtakingly beautiful and crap your pants scary as hell, especially if you've ever been in areas where visibility is very poor. I'm talking in murky waters where you can't even see your own hand in front of your face, regardless of the light or not. It makes you feel extremely vulnerable, like anything can come out and grab you at any given moment. Even more so if you're a fan of scary movies, and scary movies underneath the ocean. I've been doing it for years, and let me tell you, it's true when they say that the man has barely scraped the surface in discovering sea life. I would like to consider myself experienced at the amount of dives I've done. But even I too still panic sometimes, at just the thoughts of the unknown. I have seen things down there that would fuel your nightmares for the rest of your life. Many divers will laugh at me for this, but I'm going to continue my story and come out with the truth. It goes without saying that I'm sure rescue missions, or what they consider bringing bodies back from wreckages, is easily one of the worst parts of being an official diver. But finding bloated, rotten, half-eaten corpses is by no means the reason I'll never dive again. No, that was down to the day that I came face to face with what I can only call the Kraken. Something far worse than getting the bends. Now sure, you could laugh at me, because it might sound ridiculous, and you can believe that I must have suffered an underwater hallucination or that my oxygen was low, or that I got far too much nitrogen in my blood. But I know what I saw. I was the deepest I'd ever been down that day, on account of there having been a particularly nasty accident with a cruise liner. Several bodies were still missing. And as you guessed it, it was yours truly job to retrieve them. Something other than myself was stirring up the water, not too far from me. So, Knowing what I know, I was very careful to keep my distance, but that is when I saw it. You might ask why a kraken, and not just a giant sea octopus. Well, here's the thing. You ever seen an octopus as big as an entire shipwreck? I didn't hang about to count those limbs either, but it held at least two, what must have been once human bodies in its grasp. One look at its face and monstrous yellow eyes was enough for me to get out of there. Nobody ever believed me, but those missing tourists never turned up either. I know what I saw at the bottom, and I'm never going to go back down there. I might sound cliche, I know, but I'm terrified, and I'm not really a great storyteller, so I apologize in advance if this comes off hokey, but I'm telling you what I saw, and I've done many dives before and have never seen such a creature. In fact, if the roles were reversed and you were indeed telling me this story, I would probably laugh at you and explain to you that nothing such creature exists down in the waters. But I'll have to admit that I was wrong and it scared me so bad, not because it could have taken my life, but because the sheer randomness of it, the mystery, the potential, and knowing there might be even worse, that there might be even larger things down there that I didn't come across. Those things keep me up at night. 
and when I think back to this experience, it's all the more haunting for me, and another nail in the coffin as to why I'm done diving, at least for the time being. Hello, what lurks beneath. I am writing this email to you, in desperation. I'm struggling to want to end my life, and perhaps if you are reading this, hopefully I have not succeeded at this point. But my life has been extremely worrisome, at least for the last 15 years. I'm 83 years old, and my name is Muriel. I and the rest of my family is all based around the Cambridge, England area. And by all account, it has been a tranquil, middle-class, happy life. But I feel like my time has passed. I have weak bones now, weak organs, and I feel my vision and sight are going rapidly. I feel if I don't do this, it is time to go. But before I do end up dying, I would like to finish up any unfinished business. And one of those businesses lies in what happened during the summer of 1980 while on the island of Jersey. I was on holiday there with three of my children who were aged 7 to 17 at the time. It was by all my memories a most very peaceful and serene holiday. The children enjoyed playing in the ocean, building sandcastles, and my husband was a huge fan of golf. But something happened, something that has stalked my memory for nearly 40 years now. In fact, I remember it now more vividly than ever, just because I've had time to process it and really absorb what I saw. We had to put the children to bed, and the eldest was in the room. So, myself and my husband went for a little walk along the sea, at around 10 or maybe 11 p.m. Either way, it was after dark, and it was quiet. I just remember feeling a sense of pure peace at least at the time. My husband bribed me to follow him onto the beach and wet our feet along the cool shore. It was very enticing, romantic, and wonderful. I have been a big fan of the ocean, but the breeze at night as well as the rhythmic sounds of the waves was just utter pure relaxation. I can even tell you the white summer dress that I wore, almost down to a tee, and I remember how comfortable it was. That's just how well my memory is of this event. I was a little weary that there was nobody else around, which was usually very bustling with activity. But I guess 10, 11 p.m. at night was the cutoff. I walked arm in arm with my husband and even put my head on his shoulder. I kicked the waves and had fun. What happened next though, took us right out of our illusion of paradise and plunged us into a movie of horror. Life seemed perfect in that very moment because it was at the age of 43 on that beach and that if God creates all creatures, then he creates some monsters within the spectrum of creation too. A sharp dagger jutted into my lower leg, just above my ankle. I began screaming and fell into my husband's arms. When we turned around, both of us began screaming at the top of our lungs. A wild, unidentifiable creature with fangs had pierced right through my lower leg and was still clutched onto me with what I can only describe as a venomous fury. The creature was green and what seemed to be thick and scaly, leather skin, and was hard as a rock. It was in the shape of what appeared to be a duck, but its body was windy and bendy like that of a snake so that its head propelled up out of the water, and then its stomach went under the water before its lower abdomen rose above the water. It was most abnormal and repulsive in sight. Its face, however, was oddly that of a lizard with large glowing eyes, large black slits, and what appeared to be a beak, kind of like that of an octopus or a squid, which extended into two large fangs it's very hard to describe. This thing seemed to be embedded into my lower leg and clenched on with power and strength. All I can remember is screaming in horror as my husband tried to kick this beast, but 
but it kept warming around and didn't let go of my leg. I wasn't exactly sure what was going to happen. I nearly fainted in fear. This thing croaked and groaned in fury and agitation as my husband tried his best to save me. I felt a tug as this thing seemed to want to pull me into the water. I remember screaming no, and my husband did his best to hold on. I was then pulled off my feet and onto the ocean floor. I could feel my leg being pulled with force and purpose into the depths of the water. The next thing that happened was I felt a release, and then a sharp dull pain. And the next thing, I woke on the sand with my husband, bandaging up my wound with his shirt. He told me that, believe it or not, three dolphins formed a ring around myself and the beast, and the beast retreated. I shudder to think that what would happen if that beast would have pulled me further into the sea. I wouldn't be here today. In fact, it is surprising that I remember all of this, even though I do have an early onset of dementia. But as I'm typing this out, in hopes that this thing can be identified, if people think that sharks are vicious, well, think again. Whatever this was, was intent on killing me, and only waste deep water. It was forceful, brutish, and had bloodthirsty, savage instincts. Now, I feel like I'm at the end of my life, and I want to put things all right. So, I sincerely hope that such a beast is not a part of the world in generations to come. For I fear sincerely for our children and their children. Alright, so I'm sharing this story on behalf of my uncle. See, he's nowhere near tech savvy enough to share a story through anything other than a paper. And embarrassingly enough, he still prefers to write pen and paper in a letter format. So... I try to convince him that this is easier. He also isn't sober long enough to string together coherent sentences. But don't tell him I said that. He has a little bit of a part-time job to keep himself busy in his twilight years, I like to call it. I guess it keeps him from constantly drinking himself to poverty and death. He's part of a rotating crew on a little barge on the Mississippi River. He doesn't always spend all of his time on the clock working, though. He's actually often waiting on other people to make sure he's free to go, or clear to pick things up, and so forth. It's usually between those periods of time when he's waiting on an okay that he whips out a bottle and begins drinking. Then he gets sentimental and fires up his radio. Do you know anybody that still listens to their AM radio? Yeah. That's my uncle, all the way. It's also times like that, that he dares to cast a line over the edge of the boat, and see if he catch anything. The river fish around this area are very unhealthy, but that common knowledge is far gone to a daily drinker like him. The man is going to do what he wants. So, there he was, drinking, fishing, and getting nostalgic. He had already caught a couple of bluegill and a rather large catfish, so large that it wasn't even safe to keep. You know, parasites and the like. If you're not a fisherman, I wouldn't expect you to understand or to know what I was talking about. He was just drunk, just drunk enough that he decided it was time to take a leak off the edge of the boat. He thought it was too foggy to worry about being seen. So, he took the radio with him, because he was at that point of inebriation, that he's getting really sentimental, and he didn't want the music to stop. To his great irritation, there was all of a sudden what he describes to me as a wall of static, which didn't make sense because it was a local station. There's nothing that would make sense that would interfere with the signal. He could see the radio tower on a clear day even, from where he was on the river. So, he calmed down just long enough to do his duty over the side of the boat, but nothing prepared him to see what he saw when he came back around to the front of the boat. There was something 
perched on the railing of the boat. That wasn't entirely insect, and wasn't entirely fish. Those were his words, not mine. It had a thickly layered carapace, like something that was a cross between an armadillo and a crab. And it appeared to have forearms that were very similar in resemblance to those of a praying mantis. Whatever it was, it had gotten into his cooler where his catches were, and it was eating his catfish. The head whirled and tilted and ground away at the fish, like some sort of organic buzzsaw, while the rest of the creature remained perfectly still, almost as if it was kind of a malfunctioning animatronic. He said that it was like watching a time-lapse film sped up, and the fish was literally melting away before his very eyes. And soon, the only thing that remained was bone and skeleton. It wasn't until it finished the last morsel that this thing noticed my uncle, and that's when it froze completely. Keep in mind, from the time this thing started devouring the fish to the time there was nothing left, it was only mere seconds. Its eyes had a strange light to them, and it was the same color and intensity of a firefly eyes that looked like they were meant for seeing underwater. It immediately sprang overboard and didn't come back. When he gets drunk enough, he tries telling that story to others and they just tell him that he's the most whacked out dude they know. Or it sounds like a crazy version of the one that got away that anybody's ever heard. Me? I don't know. I've had to have my uncle tell it to me many times while he was sober so I can make a good recollection of the story, and even ran by him to make sure it was good. Again, I had to get him sober to tell me this story, which took a few different tries, so be thankful I got this coherent of a tale. I think he believes he saw something. So, in lieu of all this, I will be passing it on to your podcast, and maybe, if I'm lucky, you can read it to everybody. And if not, and you don't believe me, hopefully, stands as an interesting story, at the very least. Not out at sea, but on a very wide section of the Mississippi River. I was working on a paddle wheel, heading north on a seven-day journey. I was sound asleep, and it was around four in the morning that I woke to a sudden jolt that nearly knocked me from my bunk. A split second later, the emergency alarms all went off, at which I shot up so fast that I forgot that I had an AC duct over my head. Smacked it so hard, I put a massive dent in it. No idea how I didn't knock myself out in the process. Jumped off of my bunk, grabbed my life jacket, and was out of my room before I realized I was just in boxers. Ran back in and threw on my shorts, and bolted for the deck. Once on deck, I realized that it was a foggy, moonless night. People were freaking out, thinking we were sinking, and us, the crew, were doing what we could to keep everybody calm, not even knowing what was happening ourselves. Also, the fog was so bad, and the night so dark, that no matter how hard we tried, there was no seeing the shore or our surroundings. The freakiest part of all of it was knowing that whatever creature we had hit was absolutely massive and nobody could see a thing anywhere. The suspense at the time was driving people mad. In the end, we were all required to stay on deck until the sunrise, and thereafter, we learned that we struck some sort of massive fish. I'm not sure what sort of fish that big is swimming in the Mississippi River, but it gives me chills just thinking about it. It was a stretch of the Mississippi that is nearly a half mile wide. Anybody who has jumped and tried to swim absolutely would not have made it, unless they were an experienced swimmer. I understand that half a mile isn't that wide at all, but again, it is if you're not a great swimmer. My thinking is, again, what kind of large fish hits the bottom of a boat and nearly knocks us all off our feet like that? I don't know. I do know that the Mississippi connects to the ocean, so it would make sense that it acts as a large swimming channel for many large fish, including sharks. 
I guess I'll never know. One of my cousins is an experienced crab fisherman and has been crab fishing for the past few, I don't even know how many years. It's been a while, probably four to five. This past January, he tells me that he came in contact with one of the largest crabs he's ever seen on the face of the earth. He began to explain to me just the sheer size alone and how big Japanese crabs are. If you need help understanding, they're like six feet wide, including their legs, of course, and they're kind of crazily big. But this was almost a colossal sized crab. I'm talking probably 15 to 20 feet in length, just the body. We're talking a massive crab that could probably devour a car whole. Anyway, just wanted to share my two cents. It was terrifying. And my cousin swears by the story and says you can not only ask him, but his entire crew and captain because they all saw it too. I don't even want to know what else they see at sea or out on that boat when they're by themselves in January. Not my personal experience, but a very good friend of mine was out on his boat on the coast of Western Australia with his dog and another friend. Copped a freak wave to the side that managed to half sink the boat, followed quickly by a second that did the job through. This dude has a lot of experience and would never intentionally put himself in a situation like this, but they'd had a good day and filled their eskies bit too much weight on board and mate let his guard down for a second. He says by the time he acknowledged the first wave, the second was on top of them and the boat was under in only 30 seconds. Long story short, he and his mate were stuck seven kilometers offshore, sitting ducks in the open ocean. Also, his dog was tied to the boat to prevent him from jumping out into the water and there was no time to free him, so had to say goodbye in that instant. I think this is the point of the incident that caused a lasting effect. I can't fathom having to watch your best mate get sucked up by the ocean, knowing there's nothing to be done about it. Apparently, he made a few attempts to dive and his friend had to physically stop him because he was putting himself in danger. Anyway, this guy is pretty healthy, always been very active and a semi-pro free diver. No stranger to the ocean and hard work basically. His mate, on the other hand, is an average Joe Blow, overweight, not accustomed to the ocean, with very little chance of swimming back to shore. So they make the call. Better that he stay in the area and tread water than tire himself out trying to make it back, while my friend tries to get to shore to find another vessel. So, during this, mate's partner realizes that he isn't back in time, and they have a system in place should this ever occur. So, she gets onto the authorities, gives them the general location and time they were supposed to be back, and they start looking, but to no avail. My mate literally swam seven kilometers in the open ocean to the nearest island. I believe it was Garden Island, a naval base located off of Perth. Over the course of about five hours, actually, to be rescued by a vessel moored on the island. He gave them the coordinates of his mate, they tell the authorities and he gets picked up. Positive end to something that could have been terrible. I know for a fact that these guys have never really gotten over this incident, and I can't begin to imagine what would have been running through their minds. Thankfully, he is a very well-adjusted person and is generally pretty awesome. On a 41-foot sailboat in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay with about seven other men, doing a shakedown test cruise, planned to be out for about 12 hours, mid-1980s, not as reliable weather prediction resources. We get caught in a tropical storm, winds gusting well into the 50 mile an hour range, just this short of a weak hurricane. We had just barely rigged storm hawsers and storm sails because the one fellow on board who was the best sailor sensed the storm was almost on us, otherwise we would have died. During the storm itself, I expected to die at any time. In fact, we made a call on the radio. If you have time at sea, you know what I'm talking about. 
If not, it's not that important. For what seemed like 15 minutes, we were in a maelstrom. No visibility, but then it passed. We would live. This was at about 3 p.m., and although there was cloud cover over the course, the ambient light was such that you could see two miles or so in any direction. If you're familiar with the sea, you know that such storms, particularly in the shallow depths near landmasses, dredge a lot of things of the sea floor. We're all on deck, working lines, checking damage, and the bay area around us is choppy and churning and foaming. Old-timey sailors often use the saying, the sea is confused. I look about 15 feet off the starboard side, and something swims to the surface, breaks the surface, looks at us, and then submerges again. It was like a thin man, with humanoid shape, arms articulated like a man, a human head, but its skin was covered in scales like a snake. It looked at us, blinked its weird, heavily lidded eyes, and then dove back under. So maybe you need to know a few things about me at that moment. No drugs, no alcohol, and no head injuries. I was elated because I was glad to be alive, but my senses in that situation were sharpened, not dulled. I had, at the time, about six years experience on ships and fishing boats, and had seen squid, octopi, flying fish, sharks, all around the world. I was not the type of guy to see a patch of seaweed and call it a sea monster by any means. I made an instant decision that I was not going to say anything. What could I say? I just saw a strange creature, take my word for it. The men on this boat were all mechanics and engineers and professionals. Why get a reputation as a flake? At the time, it was important for each of us to get a D, skipper, or OOD qualifications, and saying something like that would be heavily frowned upon. And as I stood there in my life vest, soaking wet, hooked onto the steel lifeline, glad to be alive, one of the other sailors, whom name I won't mention, with over 30 years experience in the surface navy, piped up and said, I just saw a brown thing pop up on the surface. It looked like a lizard man, with a scaly face. It blinked at us with these big eyes and then went back under. Yeah, I saw it too, I said. No one else said that they had seen it. Then, we sailed back to the pier later that day and never spoke of it ever again.